In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Convinced that awesome changes are happening in our nation, filled with gratitude, but ready to intercede. We want this world, we want this nation in particular, to be a place where women and infants still pressed in their wombs are protected and cherished. We call to mind our sin. We ask the grace that especially as we receive the Eucharist, we might be the best ones to convey the truth that God is with us and God blesses moms in challenging pregnancies. God blesses infants still tucked, hidden away. We were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy, forgive us our sin, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the first book of Kings. Then Elijah, then the Lord said to Elijah, You shall appoint Elisha, son of Saphat, of Abel Mohala, as prophet to succeed you. Elijah set out, set out and came upon Elisha, son of Saphat, as he was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen. He was following the twelfth. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak over him. Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, and I will follow you. Elijah answered, Go back. Have I done anything to you? 
Elisha left him and taking the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He used the plowing equipment to fuel, for fuel to boil their flesh, and he gave it to his people to eat. Then Elisha followed, then Elisha left and followed Elijah as his attendant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, for freedom Christ set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you are called for freedom, brothers and sisters, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware you are not consumed by one another. I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh has desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you may not do what you want. But if you are guided by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When the days for Jesus being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to them, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and, and bury my father. He said to him, Let the dead bury their dead. But you, you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. To him, Jesus said, No one who sets a hand to, a, to the plow and looks to what is left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. Oh man, what a wild last couple of days. Uh, so there I was yesterday, right? It was about 1.30 in the afternoon, and um, I was, you know, working on my homily, and I had just, you know, finished crafting, you know, my introduction and my conclusion and all these good points about, you know, Elisha leaving home to pursue his religious vocation because I knew that today was going to be the first anniversary of my ordination as a permanent deacon. So I promise you, I had a really great homily prepared about pursuing your religious vocation. And then Father Ray calls me up at 1.30 and says, yeah, the Dobbs, the Dobbs decision came down, and um, we all have to preach on that. So, start over. <laughs> so 24 hours later, here I am standing before you with, uh, hopefully, uh, something that was as good as what I was going to give. Uh, and uh, I guess the first thing that um, once I had the once I had the call from Father Ray, my mind immediately went to sort of three major statistics that I had seen uh, from a variety of sources. The first that struck me as interesting was that in the United States, in a given year, we have roughly there are roughly 1.3 million abortions that occur in a given year, but there are somewhere between one and two million people who take out inquiries about adoptions. That's the first stat. The second stat was that, according to the Pew Research Center, if you survey people who have, who, have, uh, who have gotten abortions, the number one reason for why people get abortions, according to Pew Research Center, is because they perceive a lack of other options. Number three. If you survey people who have gotten abortions and you ask them, why do you think it's okay for a doctor to perform an abortion, we get a variety of responses. People say things like, because of the age, or because of the size, because of the location, because of the dependent status, because of the level of intelligence, i.e. the lack of intelligence, some people will say that it's because of the lack of abilities. Um, in extreme cases, some people will say because of the race or because of the sex. Cardinal Gregory, when he responded to this, um, when he was in his statement, he noted, he noted that on um, each of those responses that people give in surveys, each of those responses sort of reveals a different type of prejudice that 
we as Catholics and we as Americans are called to stand against. And I think this was fundamentally what the problem was with the Roe versus Wade decision. Not only was it a decision that occurred before the invention of ultrasound, right? Um, in other words, a decision that was made before we had a full knowledge of prenatal development that we have today, but it was also a decision that accepted these various reasons for why abortion was acceptable. And each and every one of those reasons, is, it's noted that each and every one of those reasons, if they were applied in any other context, would be a violation of American civil rights laws. Every single one of those reasons. And so, on the one hand, I am very glad that Roe versus Wade was overturned by Dobbs. Unfortunately, because it was, a t because it was an overturning using the 10th Amendment, it means that, unfortunately, it has absolutely no current effect on Maryland's laws. And as we know from a, couple, from a couple of months ago, the Maryland State Legislature overrode Governor Hogan's veto to make it so that people in the state of Maryland can get abortions for any reason from conception until the moment of birth, and also can receive state funding to do so. So I think this is the challenge that we're facing today. And our readings today, I think, give us, a, uh, give us some advice on how we can witness to the reality of the value of human life. And our first thing I want to bring up today is what St. Paul talks about in our second reading. St. Paul talks about that in each and every one of our hearts, there's a conflict between the life of the, what he calls the life of the flesh and the life of the spirit. And what he says, whenever we're confronted with, like, with a major uncertainty in our lives, the life of the flesh speaks to us and says, be a skeptic, right? You can't trust other people. You can't trust the future. You can't trust God. The life of the flesh also says things like, no, 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 the most important thing when you're confronted with uncertainty is preserving your own position. The life of the flesh, says St. Paul, when we're confronted with uncertainty, tells us to focus on, on our will is the most important thing. What I want to do, what I want to get out of the situation. And St. Paul tells us that by the power of these three things combined, skepticism, desire for power and position, and desire to, to gratify our own wills, we end up going on biting and devouring one another until we are all consumed. On the flip side, St. Paul says, to avoid that, there's such a thing as the life of the Spirit. And St. Paul says, that the life of the Spirit is one that, instead of embracing skepticism in times of uncertainty, it's one of faith. Faith in myself, of being able to persevere through uncertainty. Faith in my fellow human beings who will be there for me. Faith that God will arrange things to help me in times of uncertainty. Instead of focusing in times of uncertainty on power and position, St. Paul says instead, it's a time to focus on freedom, but a freedom that can only be gotten from Jesus Christ. Notice St. Paul here was, a, as we know, St. Paul here was a great skeptic beforehand. He was someone who did not believe in Jesus, who supported the execution of Jesus, who supported the hunting down of Jesus' followers, but nevertheless, whom Jesus chose to appear to, to, appear to him in the resurrection. And when he did this, Jesus was somebody, through his crucifixion, who experienced the greatest expression of human power the Romans were able to give, crucifixion. And he rose from the dead and had a true freedom that no other human could experience. And here was St. Paul looking at Jesus and saying, he is more free than me. Now that's true for all of us. Right now, who is more free, us or Jesus? I'm willing to say it's Jesus, right? Thank you, Christian. Definitely Jesus. And so the idea is that we become more free, not when we push Jesus out of the picture. We become more free the closer to Jesus we get, because Jesus himself is more free than us. And Jesus transcends earthly power. He transcends earthly and worldly concerns. And so lastly, right, St. Paul tells us that when we're confronted with uncertainty, there's this tendency for us to go with our own wills, to gratify what we want out of life. But instead, St. Paul says, the life of the Spirit is about us, instead of doing our own wills, taking responsibility for the common good, doing not just what's good for my own will, but what's good for society, and what's also good for the overall plan of God. 
St. John Paul II called the life of the Spirit the culture of life that we are called to witness day in and day out. And uh, he, also, he, also note, he also noted when he said that, that, uh, that it seems that most people who support abortion are people who have already been born. And so this is what we have to witness to in terms of our life. We have to witness to the life of the spirit that St. Paul talks about here. Faith, a freedom that's united to Christ, and responsibility for the common good. Now, our gospel today reminds us that no matter how well we witness to this, people are, some, at least some people, are going to reject our witness. And we know this because people reject the witness that Jesus gives in our gospel today in the gospel of Luke. Who are the people that reject Jesus' witness? Well, we see the Samaritans rejecting Jesus' witness. Why do the Samaritans reject his witness? Because they have a prejudice against him as a Jew. They know he's going to Jerusalem. They do not want to serve Jesus because they know he's a Jew going to Jerusalem, and they know what he's going to say when he stops into town, and they don't want to listen to what Jesus has to say. How do people respond? The apostles respond by saying, quote, Jesus, or Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume these people? <laughs> right? What, notice how Jesus responds. Jesus turns and rebukes the apostles and says that they should journey to another village. Right? Jesus' response is basically to say, no, no, no. We're going to go to another village. We are going to be persistent in helping the vulnerable people in another village. We're still going to go and help the most vulnerable, and if we keep being persistent at that, we will eventually overturn the prejudice of the various Samaritans in this region toward us. That is Jesus' response when confronted with that. And I think many times when we witness to Jesus here, when we witness to the culture of life, we are going to get some kind of people that are going to respond to us negatively because they say, oh, you're a Catholic, we know what you're going to say. We know what the Catholics teach. We know what the Catholics are really all about. Whether they really know or not, but there is that perception that people taken from the media, they think they know what the Catholics are about. When perhaps they know some things that are not true. The second group of people that reject Jesus' witness are the would-be followers of Jesus. And these people are people that are more attached to their worldly concerns than they are to Jesus. They recognize Jesus, but they're attached to the worldly concerns more than to his witness. They just think that some things are more important than what Jesus is witnessing toward. And how does Jesus respond to them? Well, Jesus says that some of these people are not yet ready for the kingdom of God. Now, it was interesting to think about who that could be. And when I thought about this, are, you know, who's ready, these people are not ready for the kingdom of God, the first thing that occurred to me is the question of whether or not we are ready for the kingdom of God. Right? Are we the would-be followers that Jesus is talking about that are you know, not willing to accept the full witness to the life of the Spirit? Okay? Because if you think about it this way, right, we have this idea in, this, in our readings today, we have this dichotomy where who doesn't witness well to the life of the Spirit? It's the would-be followers and the apostles in the gospel. Who are the people that witness well to the life of the Spirit? Well, it's Jesus, and it's Elisha from our first reading, who is from a wealthy family. The prophet Elijah comes in and says, you are called to be a prophet of God. And Elisha knows that if he stays there on the farm and he just leaves the inheritance there, that he will end up being tempted to not fulfill his religious vocation. So Elisha gives up his inheritance. He destroys his inheritance so that he can fulfill his religious vocation. And that is somebody who, like Jesus, fulfills the witness of the life of the Spirit. And the question is, are we ready to be like Christ, and are we ready to be like Elisha, or are we content to be like the apostles who just want to rain down fire and brimstone on the people who disagree with us? Or are we like the would-be followers who are like, oh, Jesus, that's nice but I've got other things that kind of matter more to me. And the thing is, I think we can witness to this. I think we can do it well. In the country as a whole, we are a wealthy, advanced, you know, a country with, blessed with great material abundance. It is entirely possible on a strictly quantitative level that we can supply the needs for everyone who is finding themselves in a crisis pregnancy. In our laws, in Title IX, Title IX actually has protections for pregnant women and single mothers 
that says institutions of higher learning are re legally required to accommodate their motherhood or their pregnancy so that they can continue their education. I think we should talk a little bit more about that. The Catholic Church spends more money than any other private institution on women's health care, like legit women's health care. But even with those things, I still think we can do better in a wide variety of places, right? We could all be better models of chastity. We could all be more concerned and help out more with our local pregnancy centers, like CareNet Pregnancy Center. All of us can be better at supporting Project Rachel, which is a Catholic ministry that's designed to help women who have already gotten abortions, but who have been psychologically or physically harmed by going through the abortion procedure. And we can support those better. We can support the Sisters of Life, which runs a network of people that take care of women who are in, or in marginalized neighborhoods, who are on the margins of society, who are pregnant and want to bring their children to term, and they send volunteers to go and help them with their grocery shopping, with their childcare, accompanying them to medical visits and things like that. We can definitely do more of that. Right? We can, we can be better in terms of more of us can become foster parents. More of us can help the Maryland Catholic Conference go up to Annapolis and talk about where our state's funding should really go toward. Maybe it should go toward funding more of these other options than just paying for people to have abortions. Maybe in our own lives, there are people that, there are people that um, need just, our moms and dads just need an easier time, and we have the time and talent where we can do that for them. Overall, it is kind of our calling to let people know how many choices they really have. And that's actually kind of ironic because when you think about it, whenever I talk to people who are pro-choice advocates, they often seem to want to focus on promoting or offering, they don't really seem to often want to promote or, or offer other choices, if you know what I mean. Whereas we are the ones that can do that. Pope Francis, in his statement about the Dobbs decision said that Catholic parishes are called to be an island of mercy. If we're not, then I guess that would make us either the would-be followers or the apostles of the gospel. One of the things I did find very uh, reassuring was that the Dobbs decision came out on the solemnity of the Sacred Heart, the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Now, I'm sure that was not intentional, <laughs> yeah. um, but I was very happy about that because I just think that is a beautiful sign of what we are really supposed to be about. And when we receive the Eucharist, right, we put Jesus' presence inside of us and we unite our hearts to his sacred heart. And then when our hearts are united to Jesus, we are then able to create a culture of life where every human being, no matter the size, no matter the age, no matter the location, no matter the degree of dependency, no matter their level of intelligence or their ability or their sex or their race, all people are respected and cared for better than they are now. And so I guess what I'm asking you this week is to let his sacred heart move you. Let it move you to better honor the gift of life, which is according to Pope John Paul II and the fundamental message of the entire Bible. The gift of life is the greatest gift that we all possess. So let us pray. I believe in one God, God Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under the Pontius Pilate. Pilate. He, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord, you command us to follow you without looking back. We're looking ahead now, resolutely, unto even a heavenly Jerusalem. And we now pray. Please respond, Lord, hear our prayer. That U.S. Catholic leaders will have a double portion of the Spirit. As we begin this revival of the Eucharistic teaching, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That state elected officials will learn to legislate in such a way that both mother and child are protected. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That servicemen and women will enjoy a heightened spirit of vigilance during this so-called summer of rage. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That new vocations to the ordained ministry will follow resolutely in the footsteps of Jesus. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the sick might experience divine assistance at every turn. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have died will find rest from their labors. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And that all of our personal intentions, united with the prayers of St. Prosper of Aquitaine, might be granted. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, you challenge us to follow and to not look back. Here we are before your throne of grace. Use our prayer that we might make new disciples, new prophets, even as Elijah, so blessed Elisha. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Pray now, brethren, my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of his hands, the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all of his holy church. O God, who graciously accomplished the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is yes. right and just. Truly right and just, our duty, our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For when your children were scattered afar by sin, through the blood of your Son and the power of the Spirit, you gather them again to yourself, that a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity made the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit might to the praise of your manifold wisdom be manifest as the church. And so, in company with choirs of angels, we praise you. With joy, we proclaim. of all holiness make holy therefore these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall that they may become for us the body and blood of our lord jesus christ At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion he took bread and giving thanks broke it gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. If as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray the partaking of the body and blood of Christ. We may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. Bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Wilton Gregory, our Bishop, all clergy, remember servants who've gone before us, marked with a sign of faith, and Higgins and Figgins, for whom this Mass is offered, grant that she who was united with your Son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember all brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, 
bless Joseph, her spouse, blessed apostles, all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life. I may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, we pray. Graciously grant peace in our days. By the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, Safe from all distress, we await the joyful hope, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I, I am not, not worthy that, that you should enter, enter under, under my roof, roof but only say the word, and my soul shall be, shall be healed with the body of Christ. You say, unto eternal. Blood of Christ, keep you safe. Unto eternal life. Amen.
Let us pray. May the divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord, we pray, so that bound to you in lasting charity, we may bear fruit that lasts forever through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We'd like you to be seated at this time for our second collection called Peter's Pence. And again, this collection always gives the Holy Father just the wherewithal to be able to immediately have monies that he can throw toward any part of the world that's struggling, especially with a uh, tremendous crisis, especially things like earthquakes and typhoons. Other announcements are simply, we have uh, unlocking the mystery of the Bible, 10.15 to 11.15, uh, that's tomorrow on Sunday. We have bingo later on tomorrow evening as well. A reminder that we have, again, great confidence that God is blessing um, our church in this time of challenge. From around the archdiocese, only one priest recorded that 30 Antifa surrounded the church with great rage in the District of Columbia uh, at St. Peter's on Capitol Hill. But there were 80 devout Catholics wearing scapulars about this big. That looked pretty scary, and the Antifa people quickly disappeared because there were even more police, about 150 policemen who surrounded that scene and quickly, the no anxiety. So we're so grateful for the police presence in the District of Columbia as we ask such grace in this time, that it might be a time for everyone to rethink how they legislate, that we legislate saying, no, we're gonna love child and mothers together we're going to ask such grace even right now for our permanent deacons. So this is his first anniversary, a permanent diaconate, and Deacon Ammon, who's in the back row with his wife right now, I think he said it's his 12th anniversary. 12th. So for our permanent deacons. <laughs> We're so grateful for their witness and their presence here with us. And again, the big day, July the 6th, will be the day when we get our new assistant priest called a parochial vicar in our new language. And his name again, Father Ryan Brahm. He likes being called Father Brahm. And as I tell everyone, the word Brahm in Dutch means Blackberry. So you can call him Father Blackberry. I give you permission. <laughs> we stand for final prayer and blessing. The Lord be with you. May the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.